Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see so many faces again. Um, we've actually been recording some of the, the online services for those of you who have been watching um, you know, around the building, but it's, it really hasn't been the same without some extra faces here. So it's good to see you all back, and um, we really hope that you have a, a blessed time worshiping with us this morning. Just before we get going, just a couple of um, announcements to bring your attention to. Um, as we said last week and in the newsletter, we've decided to put MTC on hold for the moment. Um, I know a lot of you are keen to get back into that and start up again, um, but just with a whole lot of things happening at the moment, we've just decided to put the brakes on that for now, um, and we'll start that up again um, soon, but we'll definitely give you enough warning. And then on Friday mornings, our men's group is gathering again at six o'clock, um, so if you're keen on um, just gathering together with other men before work and enjoying a time of, of fellowship and prayer and um, some scripture reading as well. Um, please join us on Friday mornings at 6 o'clock. And then talking about prayer, um, we're starting a group on a Sunday morning. Um, just with this season, um, I think you'll agree that it's important that we really dedicate our, our time and our lives to God every day. Um, and so we've really decided to, to start a, a prayer group on a Sunday morning. And that's going to be, uh, we started this morning, I believe, I'm not sure if anyone attended, but um, at 8.15 um, until about quarter to nine. Um, so every Sunday morning, I believe we're going to meet in the library. So if anybody is keen to join us, please join us next Sunday um, at quarter past eight. Um, Sunday school, we've decided to just give it a break for this week as we're just slowly getting things going again. Um, so we'll start Sunday school again next week um, for those of you who have children. Yes. Um, and then on the 12th of August, um, we're starting, um, how many of you have gone through the Intimate Encounters course? Oh, I haven't, but who has? <laughs> okay, so for those of you who have, um, or and those of you who haven't, this is a, like a, a marriage enrichment course, but it's not only for those of you who are married, it's also for those of you who are looking to get married. Um, so it's a, a wonderful ministry that George and Sheena Jenkinson lead. Um, so that's starting up again on the 12th of August. If you are interested in joining that, please um, be in contact with either George or Sheena and let them know that you'd be joining them. And then what else? Just a, a reminder as we are gathering again um, to please help us keep each other safe. Um, those of you who saw the newsletter this week, there was a couple of um, like a just sort of checklist that you can go through when you come to a service. So just, again, make sure you're wearing your mask all the time, keeping distance from other people, and just helping us to keep each other safe so we can continue gathering like this. So, um, yeah. And 
I think the last thing is just a, a couple of prayer requests. Um, obviously, with everything that's happened recently and the, the continued stresses of the season, um, continue praying for the Osborne family at this time. Um, continue praying for the other families affected um, and impacted by this. Um, and also continue to pray for the leadership team and the, the staff at Mountain View as we really try to aim to lead well during this challenging season. Um, but then also you just continue to pray for those who are, are recovering from COVID or, or have COVID at the moment. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know that this season has hit harder or, and closer to home than many of the other waves. Um, so please continue to pray for them. But let's start this morning with our New City Catechism, and we are in question 31. Question 31, which says, what do we believe by true faith? What do we believe by true faith? And the simple answer is that everything taught to us in the gospel. But the answer expands and says, the, Apostle Creed's ex the, uh, the Apostles' Creed expresses what we believe in these words. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The short letter of Jude says in Jude 3, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. As has been the case over the last like two or three questions that we've dealt with on faith, um, it's very important to understand these truths. And this is one of the main reasons that we're going through the New City Catechism, so that we can not only learn these truths together, but also internalize them and have a, an answer ready for those who maybe ask us for, for why we hope in these things and what we believe. So here's D.A. Carson to help us understand what do we believe by true faith. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So begins what is universally called the Apostles' Creed. Strictly speaking, it was not formulated by the Apostles. It emerges in the second century. But what is meant by the Apostles' Creed is not that the Apostles formulated that exact expression, but that the summary of what is given in the Creed reflects the doctrine of the Apostles, the doctrine of the New Testament in summary form. It's, a, it's an early Christian confession, but it is so early and has been used so widely across Christian denominations all around the world that it is one of the rare things that unites all Christians in common belief. If you read it through carefully and slowly, you'll see there's explicit mention of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, of creation, of the virgin birth, the coming of Christ, his rising from the dead, uh, who Christians are, what it means to have the Holy Spirit working within us, and so forth, all in very brief compass in words that millions and millions of Christians have either memorized or recite every Sunday or sometimes use as part of their private devotions. One of the things that's important to remember is that creeds are sometimes shaped, at least in part, by the era in which they were formulated. Not because the Bible changes, but because the questions that we ask of the Bible change just a wee bit from time to time. So that there are other creedal statements, for example, that are made at the time of the Reformation in the 16th century that ask and answer slightly different questions. But this one is regularly said by Christians all around the world because it was so early that it was used before a lot of the later doctrinal, important doctrinal divisions set in. And within this framework, it very ably summarizes the gospel itself in, in just a few sentences. In some ways, it reminds me uh, of a kind of second century attempt to recapitulate what you read, for example, in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 15, which again is, is a very simple creed. 
What is the gospel, Paul asks? Well, first, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and then various things are added and added and added until you get a summary of the great good news and its content that God, in the fullness of time, sent forth his son to die on the cross, rise from the dead, and, and bring to himself a vast number of, of the people that Paul calls the new humanity. So when you gather for public worship on the Lord's Day, remember that behind the mere words on the page as you recite the creed, there is 2,000 years of Christian history. There is linking of Christians across cultures and languages and space and time as together Christians say, we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And what a privilege that we get to gather this morning to worship the God Almighty this morning. So let's pray together and I invite the worship team to join me up here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather once again this morning. Lord, what a, a privilege to see each other's faces, um, to, to really just fellowship again together, but most importantly to come together to worship you. Lord, thank you for bringing us through another challenging season. Um, thank you for your continued grace in sustaining us. And as we prepare to worship you this morning, we pray that you would help us to put aside anything that may distract us, that may hinder us from worshiping you, and help us to, to focus squarely on you this morning. May everything that we do be pleasing to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. As uh, Pastor Lucas said, it's so awesome to be back here and see all your faces. Church is different without people's faces, so so good to see all of you. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. <clears throat>
deeper than the truth. Remind me how I belong to you. I can't see past the dark of Remind me you're always by my side when the light. Lord God Almighty, you are beforehand with men, for you have reconciled yourself to the world through the cross, and do beseech, plead, urge, appeal men to accept reconciliation. It is our responsibility to grasp the overtures of grace, for if you, the, the offended part, act first with the word of appeasement, I need not call in question your willingness to save, but must deplore our own foolish maliciousness. If we do not come to you as one who seeks your grace and favor, we live in contempt, anger, malice, self-sufficiency, and you do call us an enemy. You have taught us the necessity of a mediator, a Messiah, to be embraced in love with all our hearts. As a king to rule us, a prophet to guide us, a priest to take away our sin and death, and this by faith in your beloved Son, who teaches us not to guide ourselves or to obey ourselves, but to try to rule and conquer sin. Not to try to rule and conquer sin, but to cleave to the one who will do it all for us. You have made known to us that to save us is Christ's work, and to cleave to Christ by faith is ours. And with this faith is the necessity of our daily repentance as a mourning for the sin which Christ by grace has removed. Continue, O God, to teach us that faith apprehends Christ's righteousness not only for the satisfaction of justice, 
but as unspotted evidence of your love for us. Help us to make use of Christ's work of salvation as the ground of peace and of your favor and grace too and acceptance of us as sinners so that, me, that we may live always near the cross. Thank you, Lord. And we could stand here today and just declare that, Father, that you are our everything, Lord. We come today, Father, to praise your holy name, Lord. 
thank you, Lord, for this day. In your precious name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, all. It is so good to be home. My trip was good, but it was long, and I longed to see you all, and I'm so grateful that just 10 days after I arrived back in South Africa, we were able to assemble again in this place. It's so great to see your faces. I am tempted to give you a holy hug, but I'm refraining from that due to our need to protect one another, but please know I'm hugging you in my heart today. The centrality of our mission at this church is to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost and to edify one another with the word of God. One of the key passages in scripture for us to learn to love the word and thereby learn how to love the God of the word even more is Psalm 119. And I know you've been reading through that in recent weeks and we are turning today to Psalm 119. We'll begin our reading with verse 89. One of the things I would encourage you as you read the Psalms is not just to note the beauty of the poetry, not just to try to identify the circumstances in which the psalmists find themselves, but to see what the Psalms teach us about who God is. That's the thrust. Who is God when the circumstances are great? Where is God when the circumstances are awful? He is always there. He is steadfast. And the psalmist reminds us of that today in the passage we've chosen, Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. This is the word of the Lord. And Father, we thank you for your word today. Pray that the message of the psalmist will penetrate our hearts, but also that understanding that your word is forever settled in heaven, you will prepare our hearts to receive the exposition of your word as it is brought to us this morning. Pray for Pastor Nate as he guides us in the study of your word today. May our minds be refreshed, may our hearts be renewed, may our lives be readied for the week that lies ahead. And we'll thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, Mountain View. And and get with us. We don't take these Sundays for granted like we once did, do we? There's obviously some things different about our gathering this morning. And I want to focus less on those things and more about what is the same. We have a, a sign out front, in front of the, or right, right above the mantle of the fireplace out there that reminds us of what this church is about. That comes from Ephesians chapter two. And here we're reminded of the work of Christ. Where Paul, the apostle, Ephesus, and says, so then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, 
but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. While we have that reminder out there, we wanted to make it very clear What remains the same? Our mission is the same. This church is not built on any individual but Christ. Our cornerstone, and it is built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. What's that? That's that's the word of God. The prophets, as the Lord spoke to them through the Old Testament. The apostles, as the Lord spoke through them in the New Testament. This church is founded as Christ the cornerstone and its business is to proclaim the word of God, to fixate ourselves on the work of Christ and proclaim the good news, the word of Christ. Hopefully, you've noticed um, what might appear to be a bit of an obstruction in the middle of this stage that is very intentional. May nobody walk in here and miss the purpose of what we are about. Guess with us. If there's anything we need to do right now, it's to be reminded of the goodness of God, best displayed by his love for his people as he sacrificed his life on the cross. we will continue to be about that same business. And as Paul likens it in our text this morning in 2 Corinthians, that is a ministry of reconciliation. Let me read that text for you. If you have your Bibles, find your way there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 20 this morning. Where Paul says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. I want to dwell on that this morning. How incredible is this? God wants to be reconciled with wicked sinners. Who is that? Everybody's, I don't know. That's, that's every one of you. We are all lawbreakers. God wants peace. Think about that. John Wesley said, What unparalleled condescension and divinely tender mercies are displayed in this verse. Did the judge ever beseech or plea a condemned criminal to accept a pardon? Does the creditor ever Plea a ruined debtor to receive an acquittance in full. Yet, our almighty Lord and our eternal judge not only vouchsafes or promises to offer these blessings, but invites us, entreats us, and with the most tender importunity solicits us not to reject them. Let's pray. Lord, you are our Father, our Father in heaven, enthroned over all, sovereign and almighty. Lord, nothing comes to pass that you did not foresee, ordain. Lord, nothing is out of control. Despite the darkness and the seeming chaos, 
the world in a wreck of decay due to sin, Lord. You have orchestrated from before the foundation of the world a plan to display your love to it and bring yourself the maximum amount of glory by pouring out grace upon grace, new mercies every day upon rebellious, wicked sinners like me. That newness is not new once, but every single day. We can crawl back to you pleading for forgiveness and you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are desperate, wholly dependent upon you for even our very next breath, Lord. We know that you hold all life in your hands. You created it, your word, and sustain it. So, Lord, save us through it as we hear your word again this morning. Not my words, your, Lord, but yours. Make me small, Lord. Destroy any pride, any attempt of my own to steal the glory that you deserve. No clever words, no human insight but only we preach Christ and Christ crucified. Glorify yourself in our time this morning. Amen. We start off these verses with Paul saying, all this is from God. Paul reminding us that the source of, of all of this newness, previous verse, we are new creation, this this, this fear of the Lord that, that motivates us to, to reach and share with others. This love of the Lord that compels us and controls us to share about how he has died for all. Verse 14. All of this, this new perspective we have on, on, on all the people around us. Our new perspective of Christ that he is Lord. All of this is from the source of all. As he writes to the Romans in chapter 11, verse 4, for from all and through him, so for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. Amen. What is all this? It's everything. It's, it is all this. In Ephesians 1, in just um, 11 verses, Paul writes that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places has been given to us in Christ. Remember those important words, in Christ, which Paul uses over and over. In Christ, he chose us. In Christ, he predestined us. In Christ, he adopted us as his children. In Christ, he redeemed us. In Christ, he forgives us. In Christ, he lavishes us with grace. In Christ, he's revealed his will to us. In Christ, he's bestowed upon us an inheritance, not only reconciling us, but making us co-heirs with Christ. In Christ, he has sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit and is with us until the end of the age. All this means all this. All this is from God. Now he gets more specific about this ministry. All this is from God. Everything I just said, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Christ reconciled us to himself. And why is that? To be very clear, the affirmation, the aforementioned blessings we enjoy in Christ are only for the redeemed and reconciled in Christ. Meaning apart from Christ, you and I are under the condemnation of God. We have a huge problem. God is holy and we are not. Guilty sinners and lawbreakers falling far short of the glory of his perfection. 
as Paul writes in Romans 6.23, right? The wages of sin, the wages of breaking God's law, of being anything less than his holy perfection, is death. And in 3.23 of Romans, and that includes everyone, all have sinned. You think you're pretty good? Pretty good isn't good enough. Perfection is demanded by God's holiness. Not only that, not only have you broken his law, but you're an enemy. Alienated and hostile in opposition against God in your sin. I'm sorry, that's the bad news. There's good news. There is good news. Fortunately, there is a solution. However, there's only one. This is how Paul puts it in Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So therefore, we have been now justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by God. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom have received reconciliation. Praise the Lord. Through Christ, we have been reconciled to a holy, perfect, righteous God. Paul puts it another way to the church in Colossae. He says it like this in Colossians 1, starting in verse 19. For in him, that's in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, you who once were alienated, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. We have been reconciled by grace through Christ. And not only that, been given the ministry of reconciliation. The Lord's ministry or the Lord's service or the Lord's work is now something we are invited, privileged to participate in. How can that be such marvelous and astounding grace? Here we were under the domain of darkness, living out our lives according to the cravings of our flesh and every wicked thing we desired. And by grace and mercy, the Lord comes in there, but God, rich in mercy and grace, steps in transfers us, rescues us from that. We have deliverance, salvation from that domain and placed into the kingdom of the son he loves. Peace. And not only that, but an inheritance to be a co-heir with his son that made that peace possible, that reconciliation possible by his death through the cross, appeasing the wrath of God for sin for everyone who believes. Obviously, this is, this is 
astounding and hard to believe. So Paul goes ahead and does a double take. You know, he says, that is, at the beginning of 19, or in other words, or hold on, this bears repeating. Listen to it again. Note the comparison between the first and second half of verse 18 and the first and second half of 19. I'm going to read 18 again. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. The second part of verse 18, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The second part of verse 19, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You see, verse 19 further clarifies verse 18. As Paul is going, I know this is difficult to understand. Let me try to say it another way. Remarkable grace. We're invited, given the ministry of reconciliation, which has been made possible through Christ, who's reconciled us to himself, to God. And then to clarify that and take it further, in Christ, Paul says, God reconciles the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. God reconciling the world to himself. is again, in Christ, God reconciling the world. And why was this necessary yet again? Because you have trespassed against him. All have. We all have. And how does he do it? Imputation. Or the forgiveness of our sins through Christ's death. Imputation. A big word meaning to attribute or to reckon as an asset into someone's account. It's generally a financial term. Our trespasses are not being counted against us. It's not that God forgets. He doesn't forget our sin, but our sin has been fully paid. He takes that sin, places it on Christ's account, takes Christ's perfect righteousness and covers us with that. There is an exchange, an imputation, a transaction that happens in this process. And our sins forgiven. Doesn't count them against us. Where does it go? Onto the cross. Onto Christ. We can have forgiveness through Christ's death, but that's it. That is the way, that's the truth, that is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. No one approaches that holiness, that righteousness, except through Christ. This isn't a verse that the universalists would support to say all, their, all are saved. God reconciled the world to himself. See, we'll all be in heaven. No, 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 don't miss it. In Christ, God reconciled the world to himself through Christ we've been reconciled only through Christ pastor John MacArthur this is the heart of the doctrine of justification or being declared righteous whereby God declares the repentant sinner righteous and does not count his sins against him because he covers him with the righteousness of of Christ the very moment he places wholehearted faith in Christ and his sacrificial death. We are reconciled. Being evil, wicked, lawbreakers, hostile in mind, in opposition of God, we are given peace and forgiveness the remission of our sins, our sins removed from our account and placed on Christ. God poured out his full wrath on his own son in order to reconcile us to himself. And again, given the ministry of reconciliation, clarified in verse 19, entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. See, that work... That ministry, that service of reconciliation was done by Christ and only Christ alone. The work is finished. Now, what's the invitation we have? 
is to share a message of reconciliation. We share a word because the work is finished. We're invited to share that good news. Jesus Christ accomplished reconciliation between God and man. His sacrificial death on the cross on behalf of sin, appeasing the wrath of God and restoring peace by His blood. And by grace through faith, a sinner may repent, call upon Christ for deliverance and receive forgiveness, being declared righteous by God in Christ. There is no better news. So the application, okay? Paul says, therefore, which whenever you see one of those, you always have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? Therefore, in verse 20, okay, so what about all this? What's it all mean? If in Christ, then Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God makes his appeal to us. We, you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Our role in this ministry or this service, this work of real reconciliation, is to be an ambassador, a representative, an ambassador of Christ. This term describes a representative in this time of a king from one country to another. Or in the case of the believer in Christ, a messenger representing the king of heaven with the gospel with the people of the world to be reconciled to God in peace through Christ, who is their rightful king, and to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. Embrace him now as Savior in love, or face him later as judge in wrath. And what is that message exactly? It's as if God is making his appeal through us. This is God appealing, pleading, urging, begging you, please accept this offer. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Repent of your sins in faith and believe in Christ for salvation. You can be saved from that impending wrath. We implore you on behalf of Christ reconciled to God. This word of Christ that we are to share is the good news that the word of Christ is finished. The wrath of God towards sin has been appeased, has been satisfied in Christ's sacrifice alone. Come today, sinner, and be reconciled to God through the complete work of God and find it in Jesus. John, in his first epistle, puts it this way in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation or the means of appeasing God's wrath and gaining the good will or favor, the grace. He is the propitiation. God made possible the appeasement. He's the propitiation for our sins, not only for our own, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by that we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. For by this we know that we're in him, in Christ. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Or live in the same manner, holy and blameless as Christ did. So be reconciled, sinner, to God through the work of Christ. And have an ambassador before him in Jesus the righteous. 
And to you, Christian, a new creation in Christ, called to be an ambassador, a representative, a messenger, as Paul says, motivated by a fear of the Lord and compelled or controlled by a love of the Lord, then share and declare this message of good news, the good news of Christ with clarity and boldness. Immerse yourself in that gospel news every day. It's our only hope. It's good news. It's great news. There's no better news in Christ. All who believe and call upon Him to be saved by grace from the imminent wrath they deserve. Do you believe it? If you believe it, then who are you going to share it with? You cannot claim to love anyone you wouldn't share this good news with. Surely you're not looking out for anybody's best interests if you're not willing to share with them their only hope is in Christ. You say, oh, but Nate, Pastor Nate, you don't even know. I have stumbled and my walk is, it has barely become a crawl. Brother in Christ, sister in Christ, I plead to you, Repent. Step out of the darkness. Turn from your sin and in faith walk in the light. Come running back to the open arms of your Savior and Lord. He's waiting. Be restored to fellowship with the Lord and with His body, the body of the church. Just before the passage is read from John, he addresses this. I'll start in verse 9 of chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you. We've heard from Christ and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us all sin no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness come back receive forgiveness be reconciled and restored in fellowship with the Lord With regard to the relationship between God and man, reconciliation is what God accomplishes. Exercising His grace and His mercy towards sinful man on the ground of the death of Christ in propitiatory, wrath-appeasing sacrifice under the judgment due to sin. By reason of this, men in their sinful condition and alienation from God are invited to be reconciled to Him. That is to say, change their attitude towards Him and accept the provision God has made whereby our sins can be remitted or forgiven and they themselves, we ourselves, be justified in the sight of Christ. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your work of reconciliation. A work only you could accomplish in Christ. A perfect sacrifice. Not that Christ had any sin of which he had to die for, unlike us. But he was perfectly obedient a symbolic sacrificial lamb without blemish or spot in whose sacrifice you accepted and raised him from the dead. And we appeal to Christ. Understand we are wicked enemies, rebels, lawbreakers. 
And even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What radical, uh, scandalous, uh, abundant grace and love you've poured out upon us. And further then, you appeal and beg and urge and plead out of your great love. As we know, because of your love, you sent your only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not receive that punishment we are due and receive the wrath we are due for breaking your perfect law, missing the mark of your perfect holiness. It's unbelievable, which is why we must immerse ourselves in it daily as we soak ourselves in the word and soak ourselves in the gospel, as we savor it, meditate upon us. And what starts out of fear of wrath becomes something we do now that we delight in, we take joy in, out of love. In this transformation taking place as we become new creation, we desire to share this with everyone. May we proclaim it boldly and clearly. Lord, and any individual in here, we pray they are hearing your voice as you call now. And your sheep will respond, Lord. May there be those who don't know you, don't know this peace, don't have salvation in Christ. May they receive and accept this invitation and this offer even now this morning, Lord. And may you receive all of the glory that you deserve. We look forward to a day where we will surround the throne with brothers and sisters from every tribe, every tongue, every language, every people. And we will all declare and you will receive all of the glory that you're due. Until then, Lord, may we proclaim it daily in our own lives, this wonderful news. Peace is possible. Be reconciled to God. Amen. As we close, we've made a bit of a habit of this, and I want to send you out with Paul's concluding words in 2 Corinthians. I think they'll be on the board. You can say them with me, but may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Just a reminder, guys, we uh, can continue our worship in the form of giving. You know there's a box there and we have SnapScan. You can take care of it online. Um, but understand we are, we are still a pleading and every day asking for grace and further strength and patience as we move forward together. We have many needs and we trust that the Lord is going to provide those things. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your many phone calls and prayers of support and encouragement as we walk through this journey together. You don't understand how remarkable, perhaps, the Lord has been in all of these things. It's easy to be overwhelmed with the darkness and how much hurt there is, and we have a lot of it. But God has been good, and I encourage you this week to reflect on the goodness and the mercy of God in all of these things.